working towards his PhD in physics here in Karlsruhe. And he also worked for Blue Yonder. And he will present us a tool called TS Fresh for a time series feature extraction. And with this tool, you can either get rich or die overfitting. So give a warm welcome to Niels Braun. Yeah, thank you for this nice introduction. So I hope you're all here because you want to get rich. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so first of all, I have to admit, um, you will not learn how to get rich during this talk. So you can all go now, it's fine. Um, but you can also stay and learn the tools that you need, the ingredients, how to extract features from time series, and this will then lead you towards the way how to get rich. Okay, so I will talk about time series. So what is a time series? A time series is just recording some value over the time. So for example, you can think about, I want to record my heart rate during this talk. So we are now here at this peak. And um, you can think about other things. For example, you have a device in the IoT business and you record the temperature over the time. And then the question is, how can we use this time series, so this recorded value over time, for machine learning? There are quite some um, different domains where your time series can come from. For example, IoT, Industry 4.0, uh, precision medicine, connected cars, or even physics. And <clears throat> what you want to do is to feed this time series into your machine learning model. So for example, you want to predict if this device where you have measured the temperature will break in the next day or the next few days. But you cannot just feed this time series into your machine learning model because we have a dynamic problem here, not a static one. So the machine learning model has, for example, to learn that a peak after five minutes is the same as a peak after 10 minutes because the maximum temperature itself is the one that breaks the, the device. So what we do here is we map the structured input of the time series into a lower dimensional space. So what does this mean? We extract features. Okay, what is a feature? A feature is a value that you can calculate with your time series. A very simple one is the global maximum, you can see here, of this time series. So this would be a feature. But there are other features like the median or the mean of the time series, the global minimum, or for, for example, you can count the number of peaks in this time series. So these are all features you can think about, like a Python function, you feed in your time series as an array and you get back one value. So this is a feature. With these features, we can now feed our data science model, our machine learning model, and then predict um, our target that we want. So the next step in this process is, of course, we want to automate our feature extraction. Automating the feature extraction will not only lead you to a faster and easier feature engineering process, but you also do not need any knowledge of other um, signal processing libraries than you, you're working on. So you only need your domain-specific knowledge and you hope that other people with domain-specific knowledge in other domains have already implemented the correct way in these um, features. Also, automated feature extraction plays a crucial role in the whole stack of automated data analytics, analytics for example, in live data analytics or stream data or data analysis as a service. And it also helps you efficiently reduct the sample size if you want to transport your data from your sensors to your computing center. Okay, so now we know we want to automate feature extraction, but there's one drawback. If you just automize the feature extraction and extract like 500 fe features from your time series, you end up with many that are irrelevant to your target. The problem here is not only computing time, but it's also the curse of dimensionality. So I, I think you all know that. Um, you have in one dimension, you do a cut-based analysis, and then you maybe do a cut in the middle, and then you have lots, lots of statistic in both bins. But if you increase this to two dimensions, three dimensions, or n dimensions, so if you have 500 features, you have 500 dimensional feature space, and then the number of statistics in each bin is low, so you're prone to overfitting. Okay, so how cool would it be if there would be an automated feature extraction library 
plus feature selection, all written in Python and all open source. Yay. Yay. Well, okay, let me introduce to you TS Fresh. TS Fresh stands for Time Series Feature Extraction Based on Scalable Hypothesis Tests. All right, so this is what we do. Well, we extract the features from the raw time series and then we select them. So let me walk you through, through the details. We start with the times, raw time series data, in our case in the pandas data frame format, and then we do the feature extraction. So we have a library of more than 60 feature extractors or with different parameters that are all run on parallel on this time series you feed in. So you end up with features, for example, like the global maximum or the standard deviation, but also more complicated ones like features from the fast Fourier transformation or wavelet transformations or stuff like this. With all these features, we then do a hypothesis test. So we calculate the p-value if this feature is relevant to the target you feed in or not. After you've calculated a p-value for each feature, we can perform the Benjamini Yekutzieli procedure, um, which yeah, throws out all irrelevant features, um, respecting a global false discovery rate that you can feed in. And you end up, in this case, with these features that are done relevant to your target. During the development of TS Rush, um, we have thought lots, lots about speed. So the framework itself is optimized for speed. It's multiprocessing um, and it runs in parallel. And the features extractors, of course, are all using already known binary libraries, for example, things like NumPy, SAPA, and stuff like this. With the more than 60 feature extractors and in total more than 500 extracted features per time series, and the selection which is ready for classification or regression talks, tasks, so whenever you have a real value or a binary target, um, we can yeah, handle large use cases, a large number of use cases. But still, we tried to make it as easy as possible to use, and we have interfaces to the scikit-learn uh, transformers so you can use it in your pipeline. To show you how easy it is to use, I want to walk you through a short example. So we start with the pandas data frame, like this. Again, imagine you have a device measuring uh, the temperature and the pressure over the time. You can have multiple devices, that's why I have this ID, so device one, device two, whatever, and then the temperature, yeah, for different time steps. All you have to do is to feed this into our extract features method. You have to give the name of the ID of the, co of the column ID and the, the name of the column where your sorting order is written into. In this case, it's the time, but it can be anything. And what you will end with is this kind of pandas data frame where I have one line for each device and then the different features, in this case, features for the temperature and features for the pressure. And we have now extracted the mean and the maximum in this case. You can then feed, if you want, this into our select features method. You have to give your target that you want to train on and you have to give the false discovery level that you want to achieve. And then you will end up more or less with the same pandas data frame but with all irrelevant features ruled out. All right, I remember that you wanted to get rich in the beginning, so I want to show you how you can apply TS Fresh to finance data. Um, this would be just a toy example. So I hope not that you now invest um, your, all your money into this algorithm, but we'll see how it, how it will perform. So, okay, what will I do? I want to do stock market prediction, which is, um, yeah, quite relevant problem. So we're looking into, for example, here the Google and the Apple stock over the time, over a large time scale, 2010 to, to 17. And I'm looking into the adjusted closing price. So this means adjusted because adjust for things like uh, stock splittings and so on. The closing price is the, 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 yeah, the price it closes on, on each day. Okay, what I want to do is I use the data up to a given day, for example, 1st January 2015. I use all the historic data train my machine learning model on it, and then try to predict if the stock will be higher on the next day or not. And if I say it will be higher, I buy stocks today and then sell them tomorrow. Okay, so my target would look like this on the top. So you can see um, on all red bars, the stock was lower on the next day, and the green bars, it's higher. And you can see here, there it had a, had a large jump to the to top. So this is what I want to predict, not 
how much it will increase, but just will it increase or not. All right, so let's do this. Um, I'm using the Pandas data reader here, a nice tool to get the stock data. I'm fetching the stock data from Yahoo for these symbols, like 20 things, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Oracle, whatever you, you want. Then I end up with the Pandas data frames for all those stocks. Um, it was, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks ago, something. Um, not with, the, with this version, I think. You have to change the version a bit. Um, I have to look into my, all, all the rest of the code, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and also Google changed their API so you can only get one year back, not, not the whole data. But it's still possible to get some data. <laughs> Um, you can also use tools like Zipline, for example. They have this quantile, they have, they have their own library. Okay, we, we can discuss in the QA maybe later. Um, all right, and what I then want to do is I want to simulate going back in time. So what I do is I take one day and then use the data of the last 100 days and train my machine learning model on that and do this shifting through time. So this is a typical um, thing you have to do, is rolling with blocks of 100 through your, your, to your um, times, time series. And this is already implemented in TS Fresh in the, our utilities. We have a function for that, which is called rhyme, roll time series, which does exactly this. You take all your data, and then you roll with packages of 100 through your data. Before that, what I want to do is I want to treat all stocks more or less in a similar way. So melt the large data frame where one column is one stock into a larger data frame where, all, where I put the stocks all um, in one, one column. This is done with the melt function of pandas. All right, and then, well, I feed this into TS Fresh. I extract features. It's more or less the same function call as before. The only thing I've changed here, I want to use multiprocessing. So I'm using six cores um, because it was run on a server, small server. And um, then I will only want to uh, extract features of a subset, not the whole feature set we have, but only what we call efficient parameters. Um, yeah, this is a subset of all, and just want to save some time. I end up, as I said, with this kind of data frame, where I have, for each package of 100 days, the features extracted for a given symbol. All right, and then I just have to feed this day by day, into my um, XGBoost model, and then I can do what I said. If I, my XGBoost model predicts I will be better the next day or not, I, if I will be better, I buy some stocks and then sell them tomorrow. All right, this is now the performance. It goes up, well, okay, this is good. Um, you can see in blue the performance of the algorithm I've told you, and in orange, a benchmark, which is standard in Poor's 500, which is a typical benchmark you normally show to compare your algorithm against. So, first of, yeah? And also this is actually Yes, yes, I wanted to talk about this. So first of all, um, it's comparable to S&P. Well, this is kind of expected. I'm using typical stocks, and you've seen I've used the tech stocks, so it goes up. Well, this is expected. But it's not randomly going up. I also tried this with just picking up random stocks every day, and then I get like some results are, are like 500% um, plus, but most of them are, are bad. So, um, and as Alex has said, I'm excluding fees here. So I'm buying a stock every day and selling it every day, so I have a lot of fees. Okay, the reason why I'm showing you this is not that I want you to use this algorithm to uh, take all your money and then buy stocks. I just want to show you that with a small amount of code, um, I have not shown you the target um, calculation, but it's something else, um, you can already gain some usable features and a reasonable result with Tease Fresh. All right. So after this introduction into what we uh, do with how to use Tease Fresh, I want to show you some tricks, some things that we've learned during the development of Tease Fresh. Maybe that will help you in your next library. So, um, first of all, we love Pandas. Pandas is great. Um, the only thing is that if you're using this in your library and you do not do this with thinking about it, what we unfortunately did, is that it's quite slow. So, especially the creation of Pandas series and the Pandas data frames uh, should not happen often. 
And um, in our case, we have this huge group by and apply function where we group by the IDs of the time series and then apply our feature extraction on these. And in these apply functions, we actually return panda series because you can, because we thought it would be nice. But this was actually a huge bottleneck for us. So now we go just with normal Python lists with tuples and, and we are fine. And the second thing we all know, but sometimes um, don't remember, appending to panda data frames can be slow. Uh, in every case, if you do it one row by one, it's, it's really, it's really slow. So just do it in, in blocks if you can. So this is what we did for speeding up TS fresh. Um, we started with a good profiling. You should always do this, for example, with things like line profiler and there are plenty of stuff around for pro profiling Python applications. And then in our case, we've seen we had to reduce the amount of pandas objects, especially when using rendering access to them or when using masking or basic arithmetics. And we tried not to copy them around every time or move them around. Yeah. We could gain a um, speed up factor of 50%, uh, which sounds good, but um, yeah, we did not use pandas uh, the way it, it's supposed to be in the beginning. So always have a consistent speed test ready so that you can compare different git commits and that you can compare, compare if things got better or worse. The second thing I want to mention is a settings object. So our top level function extract features and select features have a large amount of parameters. Um, so for example, you can choose exactly what features you want to um, select and you want to, sorry, you want to extract. Uh, for example, based on the selection you did before. And what we started with actually was we created our own settings objects where we put some logic into so people can, users can change things and users can easily access things. And it, the day we did this, actually our number of issues on GitHub increased and we had many questions on Twitter on this. And the problem actually here was we reinvented Python because there are dictionaries, there are, very, there, there are things like dictionaries and parameter lists and stuff like this already built in Python and people just are used to this and try not to build your own things around the standard library because Python standard library is, is perfect. All right, after these two small tips, um, I want to show you the, the latest things we have in TS Fresh. So maybe you have the problem that you have too many time series to do this locally, and uh, maybe also too many time series to just do it on one worker machine. So now I can say no problem. Um, we have brought TS Fresh to the cloud. So we try now with more power and actually thanks to this nice talk in the morning and uh, we now know all about Dask. So we have implemented Dask into TS Fresh. So it's just one line more before your feature extraction. You can choose a different what we call distributor. In this case you can use the cluster Dask distributor you connect to your uh, class Dasker. Now you already know how to do this and uh, how to um, create a Dask cluster and then you can use TS Fresh with Dask. There are more things to come. So as I've said, Dask distributed is already built in. So you can now run whatever you want, maybe on Amazon EC2. And what we try to do next is to run on AWS Lambdas. So we will build another distributor for that case. We have first tested private instance for that. And we did this with the help of Flask, nice package for um, web service management, and Zappa, which even better package if you want to manage Lambdas, and you can find more information on the first blog post of Chris, who did some um, bringing TS Fresh to the AutoML cloud, and then on, also on my blog. All right, let me summarize. So now you are not rich, but you know how to get rich maybe. So I've presented you TS Fresh with the uh, feature extraction and selection py uh, Python package. It can handle inhomogeneous sources of different lengths, for example. It's ready for decentralized processing and big data because of the cloud computing. It's field tested because it was uh, developed for a consulting project, Industry 4.0, with more, now more than 2,000 stars, GitHub, wow. Um, and it's robust because it can handle overfitting because of the feature selection. So you can find more information on the docs page, on our GitHub uh, repository. I want to thank all the contributors to TS Fresh, especially uh, the top four, Max, Julius, Andreas, 
and Michael Feind for giving us help with the idea for this project. Thank you. Good question. Uh, maybe I missed some points. Uh, when you did the prediction and the trading strategy, uh, was it just kind of like in sample prediction, or did you have some out of sample component, or how no. did it work? So, yeah, that was <laughs> cheating. Um, no, what I did is um, so when I want to predict the day um, of 2nd January of 2015, I take all the data up to this date and only trade on this data. And then I can predict the next day, and on the next day, I can reuse the, the day from before. So I'm only learning on the data that I have really have available until this day. So 100 day lags, so to say. So, yeah, yeah. So um, I mean, I need more than just one row per training. So what I do is, um, when I want to predict the 1st of January, I take the data up from 2010 to 2015 and then leg it on in one of the days. So I end up with, I don't know how many days, days times uh, the 9100 of time series, and then I can trade on all of them, but just using data that I already know. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a rolling window that is well, Yeah, yeah, of course. Kind of it's kind of a, like a rolling window, but I'm not just days. calculating the mean or the median or something, but I calculate all my 500 features in all rolling window. Also consider risk statistics, by the way. I mean, just having something going up is... As I said, it's not the thing you want to do for, for finance data. So it's not the thing you yeah, want to bring to the... <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's a thing you can start off with. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering how you would incorporate type 2 error rates or control for type 2 error rates in here, because I've seen that you're using a rescaled or corrected p-value. Yeah. Uh, for like, I, I assume like you, you try to, to limit uh, the, the error done by multiple testing kind of thing? Yeah, that, that's, um, it's, it's in, the, in the procedure already, yeah, the, the false discovery rate, yeah. Um, so we have seen that the, the feature selection is not perfect uh, in every cases, that, that's, that's for sure. Um, so still you need to test this on, on your validation sample. Okay, so false negative correction or, or the, like the, the statistical power of it is not incorporated at the moment. So, as I said, in, in this uh, Benjamin Yucatelli procedure that was implemented is this false discovery rate, and, and that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, great, great talk and great package, thank you. Um, uh, are you guys working on multiple time series features like divergence between two series and things like that? We have thought about this. Um, the problem is it would be a major refactoring of our framework. Um, we do have plans for this, of course, and because there are lots of features that we still want to use for that. Um, it will not come up with our next release, but I do hope so we will have it someday. Yeah, but I cannot give you a date. Um, yeah, thank you for the for your talk. I am also was working with time series with uh, prediction monitor, with sorry, with condition monitoring. Mm -hmm. And um, the question: How do you do feature selection? So that that you said about p-value and stuff. Like, how do you know which out of sixty features are so useful? I mean, what you do is, as I said, like you calculate the p-value, and the p-value just says you um, it compares the hypothesis this feature is relevant or not. So for example, for binary, then we have different statistical methods for binary target and binary feature. We have another statistical method as for binary and uh, real value. And for example, you can go with things like cogmonov smirnov tests and stuff like this. So you end up with a p-value that just tells you this feature is relevant or not. All right. Then what you have to think about is if you're looking to a set of 500 features, and you can do p-value, and you know p-value is something with, that has to do something with statistic, you have to think about the look-elsewhere effect. So there's always something, you can always find something because p-value is, yeah, probability. So you, this is all included in this benjamini yucatelli procedure where it grows more or less with the number of, of features you have and it adjusts for this, this, uh, this factor that you have to apply because you're looking into th that many features. Um, because my question is like, if you if you do a p-value, if you check how important are features, you need to have some 
check, like you need to see, okay, that feature is important because it improved. Hmm? But in for time series, what if you don't have labels? Like in my case, for example, often I just have time series and I have no labels. I have data from one month and I have to tell predict anomaly. But I know at the end there was anomaly, for example, so I had to predict anomaly three days before, two hours before, and so on. So I don't have any labels. So how in this case do I check if... So, but you have a target that you can train on or not? I just have data. Like I just, let's say I have time series. I know at the beginning it's the, the oh, Okay, the but if you don't have any the target that we can't know if this, this feature it, is exactly, relevant. Exactly, that's, yeah, yeah. that's then exactly you just, my problem. I mean, you can <laughs> also just use it up to here and do the feature extraction. Yeah. And then you maybe looking into the features, you already gain some knowledge about your data. Um, then you can just use it as a large feature extractor library. Okay, <laughs> very good. More questions? Maybe I have a question. So what is it like running an open source project that has yeah. uh, 2,000 stars? So how did you get there? Did you do some promotion? Or? Um, yeah, actually we were quite surprised that we have 2,000 stars. I mean, we started the project. It was, as I said, was uh, constructed for consulting. Um, I worked for Blugonder during this time. And then we open sourced it, which was great. So Blugonder uh, open sourced it, but which are really glad that it happened. And then we, yeah, we kind of promoted it maybe to some questions on Stack Overflow and maybe here and there, but not very large scale, but people liked it. And then we got featured on, on different uh, online magazines. And then, yeah, but then we got 2,000 stars on GitHub, but now it's kind of stagnating. So please, <laughs> stars on GitHub. No, just, just a joke. So we're glad that people want to use it. And I think um, people were missing just this easy library of feature extractors. I mean, we have not reinvented those feature extractors. We are using them from other libraries because, yeah, it's, they know how to do this. We just summarize these things. More questions? If that's not the case, then we can go to lunch. And let's thank Nils again for his nice talk.